Now, Dynamics 2 at this time was predominantly just David Noller, DJ Scratch D. But he met Scott Weiser. Now, Scott Weiser was a monster keyboard player who, uh, according to Alex Weir, was in the group CCCP. And uh, Alex had worked briefly at Dynamix Records doing uh, remix work and rapping and so forth with them. Scott Weiser was a big fan of, of EBM music, um, the Belgian version of industrial music. He, his favorite group was Front 242. And you could see that they were going this direction. A single was released in 1991 that just remixed their old tracks. Uh, just Give the DJ a Break, the ultimate remix, and Techno Bass 2. And on the record etched was finally the arrival of industrial bass. So clearly, uh, rapping was no longer a priority. And car audio bass wasn't a thought. This was something new, and they were going a different direction. And Miami bass was starting to expand beyond what anyone could focus on. Now, before Magic Mike went to Orlando, one last project was lingering. Joy Boy Records had a competition. Uh, whoever had the best uh, demo or rap or however you want to say it, uh, submitted to Power 96, got a deal with Joy Boy Records for a single to be released and produced by Beatmaster Clay D. The group that won that was named Vicious Beat, founded by Keith Rosenberg. And Vicious Beat also had another rapper by the name of Madness and a DJ known as DJ Lace. By the time they uh, got to the studio to work on a song with Clay D, uh, reportedly, possibly, the beat that was used was something that Magic Mike was already toying around with in the 808. They took the 808, they dumped it to tape. Um, Joy Boy Records told Vicious Beat, you're going to change your name to Vicious Bass. They released the single. Single did remarkably well, not fantastic, but well. Um, the single was called Shake That Thing. When Magic Mike decided to go to Orlando, he got back in contact with Vicious Bass. And Vicious Bass said they wouldn't mind going with them. And at this point, the three-man crew had expanded to four-man. They had two DJs, Mike Jewish and DJ Lace. And all four went up to Orlando with Magic Mike to work on a couple songs for Magic Mike's debut album. The first song was Come On Rock Freak. The other song was called It's House Show. It's House Show was a song that by the time it made a cut, it wasn't fully completed. Uh, with Come On Rock Freak, there's been a little bit of debate about exactly who did how much production, when and where. But regardless, the album came out. The album did exceptionally well. The album uh, on the first 10,000 copies pressed saw the collaboration and saw immediate success. And for whatever reason, uh, Keith Rosenberg, Beatmaster Wizzy, had a falling out with Cheetah Records. So when they repressed the album, all efforts were poured in to take out uh, Keith Rosenberg's input. Beatmaster Wizzy's input could be removed as much as possible. They did. Some elements had to be left behind. They replaced one of the songs entirely with a new Vicious Bass song, not featuring Keith at all. When Keith returns, he has to find his own deal. He has to find what he's going to do. But for Magic Mike, the album continued to be repressed and repressed again and repressed again. But this time around, the artwork was, artwork was changed a little bit. There was a, a, a brick wall grafted on where it used to be blank, signifying difference in, in versions. Very few people have that, that first version, but it's certainly a superior version. Now, the SP-1200 really is the name of the game at this time. Uh, anyone who had it... Uh, somehow found their ways to innovate. Uh, that includes Gigolo Tony, who is uh, a rapper that was on Foresight Records and, and done a few novelty records such as the Hokey Pokey, Smurf Rock. He was on the Parents of Roxanne, and of course he had a full-length album on Foresight. His second album was not exactly as a signed artist to Foresight. He, he shopped it around, and it was done with the SB1200. Featured DJ Crash, Cutmaster Crash, uh, and a great, spectacular, uh, DJ track, which included uh, the edits by the Wiz Kids, which Cutmaster Crash is, of course, one of, along with Kevin Boy Wonder Flournoy, who now goes by life. These uh, these edits were as intricate, if not more intricate, than the turntablism itself. And when we talk about Miami Bass being an art form, which for many they may not believe, but it's these elements. It, it is the edits. It is the turntablism. It is the SP-1200 tricks that no other genre 
not within or outside of hip-hop had done and was doing. It's just, it wasn't very known through bad marketing. Well, the issue with Gigolo Tony's album was he signed a spectacular deal in favor of the artist with Foresight to release this album. That uh, if anything was shipped to a distributor and didn't sell and got returned, Gigolo Tony didn't have to take a cut on that, didn't have to take a hit. So as a result, Foresight Records had to take a tremendous hit for all of the records returned. And reportedly, a lot of them did. I have heard through insiders that it was up to 75% of the product was returned for some reason. Possibly marketing, possibly other issues. Well, this puts Foresight Records in, in, a, in a very poor position. And their next slated album was the second MC ADE, ADE album, How Much Can You Take? Uh, a notable album for a lot of people because of uh, the sample of John Carpenter's theme to Halloween, but also just because it was one of the first SB1200 electro bass albums there were. At times dark, and times eerie, at times just pounding. And for the emerging car audio market, this was one of those pinnacle albums that stood out before anyone cashed in on the market. And uh, had very little turntablism, very little edits, but a lot of great uh, SB1200 tricks and some fantastic vocoder work. The sounds of a deep, dark, eerie robot. Now Danny D and DJ Wiz um, had teamed up after Danny D's partial failure with Beware Records. Uh, Danny D went to the Fort Lauderdale School, the Art Institute. Um, he began working on music production there and he teamed up with DJ Wiz who was also working on some production and once they got in the studio with Steve Tempo they did two songs uh, Boom I Got Your Girlfriend and Get On Up and Dance and through a miracle they were released on Atlantic Records uh, the single got manufactured and uh, distributed and also promoted by Atlantic Records but as a dance record never to be groomed as a hip-hop act never be groomed as a uh, an R&B act or any, any other type of act. This was a club record and it did remarkably well and opened up West Palm Beach to a higher degree than maybe Cooley C had done previously with Beware Records. 